Okay, so um, do you remember? Well, there was a song uh, "Crumbling Down" by John Mellencamp. When the walls come tumbling down, when the walls come tumbling, crumbling, when the walls come tumbling down, I'm gonna put your arms around you, gonna kiss in your ear, and then the rest of it goes whatever up your rear. Okay, what else do we want to talk about? Okay, what is that song talking about? When the walls come tumbling down, when the walls come crumbling, crumbling. What walls is John talking about? I'm just looking at the chemtrails. I haven't seen chemtrails for a long time, but I was up very early this morning. And, um, yeah, they did chemtrails this morning. I don't know if you can see or not. Maybe you can see. It's kind of difficult because there's the sun up there. But, you know, you can see there's a long trail. Anyways, that's chemtrails. Um, so, what'd you get for your answer? Which walls come crumbling down? Okay. The answer for me is... Um, Give me a minute because I'm trying to get words. Oh, I got one. Apocalypse of your mind. You're going to go, what? And then you're going to think, okay, movie. There was the movie Apocalypse Now. The Vietnam War movie, amazing movie. So, what does the apocalypse mean? Well, apocalypse is biblical, book of Revelation. And no one understands that book. But, the best commentary I've heard about that book is, it was John of Patmore, uh, that's what they said the name of the author was, and it had something to do with the death of John of, John of Patmos's Is it just the collapse of his ego mind, or is it more than that? I think it's more than that. Because it is. It, it's, you know, someone who's ditched their ego. And all the visions that he had and all that. I, I don't know. It's more than just, because people traditionally say that that book is about, you know, the end of your ego. Someone who does uh, lots of internal work, meditation primarily, but there's a lot of other stuff that come, can come up as well. Processing, Stuart Wilde calls it uh, processing the dark traits that people have, you would have yourself. And the walls come crumbling down. Well, it's just that when your ego goes away, well, what walls open up? Well, you get more of your soul. It just doesn't quite fit, though, this, this idea that I have of the... It's the noosphere. You have to try and spell that. It's N-O-O -O sphere. S-P-H-E-R-E. -E, noosphere. Um... Well, you can look that up. Teilhard de Chardin was a French priest who coined that term. And it's um, it's more than telepathic contact with other people. Um, access to more information. Many of us now are getting what we call downloads. You know, when I was saying earlier, I'm waiting for words, it's because the words are being downloaded to me from the universe. So that's what we're going to call when the walls come tumbling down. Perhaps it's when you stop seeing other people as other people. Greg Braden, the spiritual teacher, you can find him on YouTube, he's excellent, um, talks about the sacred mirrors of the Essenes. You can look up those videos. 
And uh, that's what uh, Dr. Braden keeps telling us, is to look at other people as yourself. All the people at Walmart, when you go in there, look at all those people and see yourself as those other people. The spiritual practice that you can do. Why? Because they are you. Because I know they're not. Well, I know. I know everybody feels that way, especially because when humans uh, are corrupted with ego minds, we're not one thing. We're not. When we're ego minds, we are totally, totally divorced from one another, totally separate. And our job is to get past that belief. And start to see the unity of all the people, the oneness. And people with ego minds are going to say, that don't make no sense to me. And it doesn't if you're an egoic, low on the scale of consciousness. That's uh, low on the scale is animal. All kinds of animals can be calibrated uh, on the scale of human consciousness to see where animals would fit on there. And that's what it is. And animals... They look at other animals as food, or somebody who's going to predate on them. So, yeah, that, that's where ego comes from, because ego protects that individual um, animal. That animal knows it's a separate from all the other things. And, uh, I mean, if it, if it was in that state of mind that I'm talking about, when the walls come crumbling down, then that animal... We just, you know, look at that, you know, say it was a deer and there along comes some wolves and the deer would, you know, just stand there and see all those wolves that is as itself and then the wolves would eat that deer without a fight. So that doesn't work in the animal world. The animal has to have an ego so it knows that it's a deer and those things are coming to eat it and it better run away fast. It's a protective mechanism. And when we're human... It's a protective mechanism for our hum human body consciousness, the idea that we are our body. W I mean, we're, we're attached to the body. But, you know, that's about as far as it goes. So our job as a, a spiritual task is to work on seeing other humans as us and if they're egoic people it's impossible so who can you do this with well i did this with beverly woodburn many years ago we were on a spiritual retreat uh, at bowen island which is not too far from vancouver and the spiritual practice that we had i don't know we had quite a large group maybe there was 35 people there uh, and we paired off and what we did is we did the gaze into the other person's eyes technique with open eyes and open gaze. So not staring at them, but with an open heart, open eyes, and, you know, not, not staring, but more like gazing into this other person's eyes with an open It's hard. It is really, really hard to do, especially with a stranger, because when I did this with Beverly, I just met her. It's easier to do that with someone that you love, you know, someone that you love. You can do that with your dog, but to do that with other humans, to gaze into other humans' eyes, it's very difficult. Because we don't like being that, because that looks right deep into your soul. So for a spiritual practice, it's a good spiritual practice because you need to be able to peer into... No, you're not peering into their soul. You're just seeing them. You can't put it in words. You have to have it in the experience. Does that make the walls come tumbling down? Yeah. Did I see Beverly as myself? No. I did, hadn't had that lecture from Greg Braden yet. But it definitely takes some courage to look at some stranger, you know... With an open heart and open, because I was, you know, in those, that was early in my spiritual career, I don't know what you call it, spiritual experiences, yeah, that was very early on, so, you know, that was me jumping in, that was the, the name of the weekend, 
It was called, I think it was called jumping into spirit. So here I was, a very egoic person, very right-brained, going into something that's very left-brained. But, you know, I did it. Yeah, a lot of times it's like, here we go. Here we go. Another time, you know, a different experience was uh, the first time I went to a lecture on meditation. It was in Vancouver. It was at the Maritime Museum. It was put on by the folks from Ch uh, Sri, Sri Chin Moy. It was from India. And, uh, well, this young fellow, I don't know, 24, uh, got up there and gave a long talk on meditation. I didn't know what it was. That's why I went to the lecture. Because I kept hearing this word meditation, meditation, meditation for years and years. I didn't know what the fuck it was. I didn't know. So I went and I sat there and then... I don't know. Did I med I still wanted to, but I thought, this is too flaky for me because my left brainness has a hard time processing right brain stuff, which is meditation. And, you know, my whole reaction is, I don't know, this guy was a flower boy. 24 years old, a good looking fella, he looked like he could, could have played high school football or whatever. But he was like the meditation teacher and he explained what his day job was. He worked in a flower shop, and I'm okay. He does meditation, and he works in a flower shop. And I, in those days, I could never picture me working in a flower shop. No, I worked computer tech support, telephone tech support in those days. I was very, very left-brained. You know, fixing things, fixing computers over the phone. So this other thing is like. I don't know if I meditate. I'm like, I don't know. I'm going to go out of all this technical stuff and I'm going to go into selling flowers at that time. I was going, I don't know if this is really for me. I do, I do, I do, that was sort of an anyway at home. And I, I took home the literature and uh, I read about Sri Chin Mo. And you can look him up. What an amazing fellow he was. And uh, there were some websites on the, the handout pamphlet. And I looked that stuff up. Um, did I start medit? I didn't know how. I don't. Uh, we might have. I don't know. It takes some, quite some time to be able to figure out what exactly that means. Did it help? It, well, it's a learning process. A lot of gaining of facts by reading these things and going to seminars and being introduced to these things. So yeah, you know, whatever I was in the past, you know, I was a very uptight, right-brained, closet case. Because that was another problem I had, you know, I did. Well, I didn't come out till I was 42 because just a, just bottled up inside. Though so spiritual growth is letting go of all this stuff that keeps you small, distorted, you know. I've been doing computer tech support all day and I've been on the fucking phone with a million fucking realtors and they're all demanding like fix my fucking computer now and I'm like don't worry lady and whatever I'll try and fix it and I, I did fix it but you know that's like the way it was and it was like my boss is always on me like are you spending too much time on this call or you need to move along I've got 10 or 12 people that are in the queue waiting for a tech support guy you got to get this person off the phone so it was like well okay so we would have our you know if there's a bunch of people we come to a certain point where um a pretty easy procedure but it's long-winded I don't not going to stay on the phone I'm just going to fax you these instructions and you can follow the facts and follow the facts and that'll fix it for you. Okay, and then I send the fax and then click and then hello, computer tech support and maybe we went away in. So uh, this makes you very just like go, 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 race, 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 do a perfect job though. You know, go fast, go fast, go fast, go fast, but don't screw up. So that was what you're trained to do. And it's like, okay, well, just a, just a machine. They're going to talk to you. So that's what it was. That's the takeaway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this idea of the nuosphere, 
And then once you've got this neurosphere access, the walls came crumbling down. And I think that's where we're going to be going, where there's... I haven't been there, but it just seems to be these walls that separate us from other human beings. The veils are thinning. The veils are thinning. So where that goes, that's where we're going, and I, it's just more and more... I don't have words. That's where we're going. That's about as far as I can go. Um, Teilhard de Chardin and the Neosphere.